Life is suffering. Right. Indisputable. What do you do about that? You, you voluntarily accept it and then strive to overcome the suffering that's a consequence of that. And you do that for you and you do that in a way that makes it better for other people. And then that works. And one question might be, well, how well does it work? And the answer is, the only way that you can find out is by trying it. That's it. That's the existential element of it. The proof is to be derived by the incarnation of the attitude in your own life. No one can tell you how it will work for you. It's the thing that your destiny is to discover that. You have to make the decisions to begin with. It's like, because you can't do this without commitment. You have to commit to it first. That's the act of faith that, that Kierkegaard was so insistent upon. You have to say, I'm going to act as if being is good. I'm going to act as if truth is the pathway to enlightenment. I'm going to act as if I should pursue the deepest meaning possible in my life. And there's, there's reasons to do none of those. They're real reasons. So it's really a decision. But you, you can't find out what the consequence of the decision is unless you make the decision. When you're 25, you can be an idiot. It's no problem. Even when you're out in a job search, it's like, well, you don't have any experience and you're kind of clueless. It's, yeah, yeah, you're young. You know, it's no problem. We can, that's what young people are like, but they're full of potential. Okay, well, now you're the same person at 30. It's like people aren't so thrilled about you at that point. It's like, what the hell have you been doing for the last 10 years? Well, I'm just as clueless as I was when I was 22. It's, yeah, but you're not 22. You're an old infant, right? And that's an ugly thing, an old infant. So part of the reason you choose your damn sacrifice because the sacrifice is inevitable, but at least you get to choose it. And then there's something that's, that's even more complex than that in some sense is that the problem with being a child is that all you are is potential and it's really low resolution. You could be anything, but you're not anything. So then you go and you adopt an apprenticeship, roughly speaking, and then you become, at least you become something. And when you're something, that makes the world open up to you again. You know, like if you're a really good plumber, then you end up being far more than a plumber, right? You end up being a good employer. You know, if you're a really good plumber, well, then you have some employees, you run a business, you, 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 make, you, you train some other people, you enlarge their lives, you're kind of a pillar of the community, you, you have your family. Once you pass through that narrow training period, which narrows you and constricts you and develops you at the same time, then you can come out the other end with a bunch of new possibility at, hell, at hand. And Jung talked about that, he thought that the proper path of development in the last half of life was to rediscover the child that you left behind as you were apprenticing. And so then you get to be something and regain that potential at the same time. If you go in the woods and you find a bear, especially a grizzly, well, you're in real trouble if it's a grizzly, but if it's a black bear, you know, generally speaking, if you stand your ground and make a hell of a lot of noise, that thing will leave you alone. But if you run, well, what's it supposed to think? It eats things that run from it. So that's exactly where that idea came to come from. You turn tail and run, and then the thing that you're afraid of is really a monster, and it's gonna, like, get you and eat you. It's like, well, that's true psychologically as well. So I have a client, she's afraid of elevators. The elevator door opens, she goes, that's a tomb. And I thought, oh, wow, I thought it was an elevator. But for you, it's not a bloody elevator, it's death. And so that's what you're afraid of. It's worse than that. You're afraid of being trapped inside there in the dark, alone, alone, not knowing if anyone is going to rescue you, stuck there with your damn imagination, freaking out. It's like, and if that's not, and then maybe you have a heart attack because you're so terrified and you die. So then you say, okay, well, you're afraid of the damn elevator, but it's not an elevator, it's a tomb. And the tomb is partly you and partly, it's partly the elevator and partly your unconscious mind. And so, well, what can you handle? Can you go and look at an elevator from 10 feet away? It's like, yes, okay. How about nine feet away? Yes, five feet, yes, four feet, no. Okay, no problem, four and a half feet. We're gonna go from that elevator. We're gonna look at the damn thing until you're bored of it. Cause that's what we're trying to, you should be bored of the elevator. Cause then you're not afraid of it, obviously. It's like, it's an elevator. So. This week, they're four and a half feet from the elevator. Next week, they're a foot from the elevator. And the week after that, the horrible gates of hell open and they look inside and they don't run. And so, hey, they're tougher than they thought they were. And that's what you're teaching them, actually. You're not teaching them that the world isn't dangerous because that's a stupid thing to teach someone. Bloody right, the world is dangerous. It's terrifying. And sometimes people under, they realize that and the veil lifts and they see horror everywhere. They see that. 
And then they think, well, I'm just a little rabbit. I'm over here in the corner. I can't move. I'm, I'm petrified. And then they can't move. They hide at home. They cower at home because everything has become a predatory domain. And so what you teach them is you're not as much of a rabbit as you think. So what you do first, if you're going to teach someone not to be afraid of a mouse, is teach them how not to be afraid. So you put them in a chair and you do a relaxation exercise with them. And then you show them a picture of a mouse and you say, just breathe, you know, calm down. And so they all, they calm down. And then sooner or later, they can look at the pictures of mice by themselves. And then maybe you could throw a like stuffed mouse at them. And then maybe, you know, they could walk by a pet store and look at a mouse and so on and so forth until you get them like holding rats. And so, you know, that works, works. But it works even if you don't relax them. In fact, it works just as well. So the old behavioral idea that it was counter conditioning was wrong. Just like the idea that the reason you were afraid of a rat was because of conditioning. It's like, of course you're afraid of a rat. It's a rat. You know, it's just like you're afraid of snakes. You know, to a lesser or greater degree. And people actually become more afraid of snakes as they get older, interestingly enough. Which is not what you'd really expect, right? Unless it was a biological function. So anyways, all you have to do is show people the thing they're afraid of. What do they learn? They don't learn that the thing isn't frightening. They learn that they're tough. We're built. For struggle, us human beings. You're not after um, the bubbles of bliss that Dostoevsky described in, in Notes from Underground. We're built to contend with the world. We're built to contend with reality. You want a challenge, and the best way that you can take on a challenge, because a challenge fortifies you. So you don't want to be secure, you want to be strong. And you get strong by taking on optimal challenges. And so you lay out your destiny in the world, and you take the slings and arrows of fate. And you make yourself stronger while you're doing so. And you might fail. And fortune might do you in. But it's your best bet. And, you know, people have, have extracted unbelievable successes out of catastrophic failures. And so, and I'm not saying that in a naive way. I know perfectly well what happens to people. You know, you're doing fine in life and then you get cancer. And then six months later, you're dead. And all the heroism in the world isn't going to save you at that point. But that's not the point. That's not the point. Life is bounded by mortality. But that doesn't mean that you don't get out there and contend and you develop by contending and you minimize the net amount of suffering in the world. And that's something, man, that's something to do.